Welcome to Cafe Realist. Today I'm joined from Eric, straight from California. Uh, I got in touch with you following uh, recommendations from the game lounge organized by Jason Pitt uh, from from Canada. Uh, how are you doing, Eric? Uh, I'm doing all right. How about yourself? Uh, I'm okay. Uh, I mean, uh, we're still uh, officially the lockdown uh, is being eased in the UK. It wasn't much of a lockdown in the first place. And I'm not sure it's a good <laughs> idea to ease it up right now because, uh, yeah, the the likelihood of not seeing a second peak is straightened by the fact that we will never see a actual dip between the peak. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, it's I mean, uh, it's quite bad. Uh, my my son is getting fed up at being at home, I think. But uh, yeah, we oh, we yeah, hesitate, we hesitate bringing him back to to the nursery. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, ice breaking question is asking what's what's your routine like uh, at the moment? Uh, there's so much going on in the news, uh, especially in, in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to to tell about. What's your experience at the moment with uh, with COVID nineteen and and of course uh, police violence? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess um, my my routine um, is mostly unchanged. I thankfully get to work from home, uh, which is really nice. Um, so I mostly get up in the morning, uh, sit down at my computer, go to work. Uh, work for about eight or nine hours um, and then in the evenings and on the weekends I've been running games and playing games um, and that's been that's been fun that's good stress relief um, regards to Black Lives Matter and all that protests um, I think they're really important um, I don't want to speak over uh, black or African American people so I highly recommend people check out hashtags on Twitter. Um, I know the San Gennaro Co-op, which I'm a part of, has a uh, bundle on right now that is contributing, I believe, to uh, a bail fund or um, another uh, um, charitable organization in support of the protesters. So, yeah, I got uh, the... Yeah, I firmly... I got the ad in front of me, so profits will be donated to one or multiple, depending on amount raised, bill funds, supporting the protesters. So, yeah, I, yeah. I'll include a link in the description of this episode, uh, both audio and uh, and YouTube. It might take a while before it's out in audio, but uh, I think people should still be helpful, helping and concerned by about all of that, no matter how late this is released. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and you can just go to, I think, on Twitter, at San Gennaro Co-op, should have a link to it as well. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's been my experience. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a weird time, for sure. But um, I, I'm hopeful that things are changing and things are getting better, getting better where I am. Let's hope so. And uh, just uh, to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm doing uh, anything really relevant helping at the moment. I need to look into that. But I already made calls in the past if any uh, person of colors of, or minorities would like to be featured on the show. The, my door is entirely open and they should not never hesitate to, to come and join. Uh, um, I don't know if it's appropriate or not. Uh, I don't feel quite comfortable reaching out to people of colors. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I'm not. Uh, maybe I'm being considerate. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. But if you are a person of color, if you know someone, uh, you know, I got people. You don't have to be a. I mean, uh, there are definitely great designers, streamers, content creators of colors. Even if you're not, if you're just part of this community, there's so many people, white people, who were just members of the community. They happen to visit London or to be in London or to be available and send me a tweet and they're on the show. There, there's absolutely no... 
uh, we don't have. I mean, we got an amazing guest there's today. There's no screening process. Th yeah, there's no screening process. There's no. There's absolutely nothing. If you if you are keen on having a chat and talking about whatever you want, uh, please do do join us. And uh, it's about the community and uh, inter engaging with as many people. Uh, as possible so never ever hesitate to, to contact me and uh, and even if you're not t let me know if you think I'm an idiot for not reaching out directly for going out there and contacting people <laughs> of colors uh, let me know so it's just because I don't know I'm a I'm an idiot I just don't want to hurt feelings and uh, I feel useless and uh, anyway it's not about me feeling useless or not but uh, just let me know what you think uh, about anything and uh, and uh, yeah be happy to listen unless your message is uh, all life matter and some racist bullshit you can uh, <laughs> fuck yourself uh, I'm pardon my French on the roll list but I never I'm never vulgar I never use language but seriously uh, fuck Nazis fuck everyone being racist and being uh, clearly a part of the problem it's uh, it's completely nonsensical so fuck you all okay <laughs> now that is <laughs> sort for that's a good this disclaimer i like it yeah i mean it's uh it's not my own <laughs> it's uh <laughs> i'm paraphrasing a lot of people um so yeah there we go so um yeah, tell me about your work because I'm a complete. Uh, I claim sure. uh, I got the claim of being the least knowledgeable podcaster in the hobby. Uh, that's a title I'm very <laughs> proud of. I think it gives a little bit of freshness to the interviews because uh, I, I might ask questions other would not ask. I might also ask stupid questions, but at least they're original. So t tell me about mm -hmm. yourself, Eric. Tell me about your work. I was told you want to engage with a great community. You should engage with Eric the Beric and his community um, <laughs> and his work. Well, I'm, I'm very um, happy to hear that. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to wh whoever is telling you that. Um, I've uh, built kind of a small community around um, a game I've been working on uh, for the past year or so uh, called Brinkwood. Um, and basically what I did is I set up a Discord server um, and I invited people to come and play this game. Um, and uh, from those humble beginnings, we've kind of branched out into other games as well. So we're running games by uh, Jamie Temporal Hiccup, um, where we've run games like Our Queen Crumbles, um, games by people like Josh Ostrich Monkey, uh, Extra Causal, a um, bunch of j basically just like if there's an indie game, you know, and I have the time slash bandwidth to run it, you know, I'll put it out there for my community and try and run it. Um, we also got a few other GMs who uh, will run stuff occasionally. Um, uh, the, uh, the quarantine has actually been kind of like a weird mixed blessing for me because uh, everyone has time now. Um, or everyone did have time. Um, so there was a lot of opportunity to put together online games and uh, have people come and try new things out, uh, try out games, uh, do play testing, give feedback, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great community. Um, if you are interested out there, um, we welcome everyone, uh, except for, again, fascists and Nazis. Uh, you can find us at uh, brinkwood.net. Um, that will take you to the main page for Brinkwood, um, which should have a link uh, to our Discord. Um, and I'll also be uh, retweeting it as well um, again. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of probably what you heard about in terms of uh, community and things I've been building recently. I put the link in the, the description again so people don't have to try out different spellings especially if they're, they're not native speakers like me. Uh, well, Fair what, enough. Fair what, enough. What, what was I? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, the the quarantine is, uh, is indeed a, a weird blessing. Uh, I've got my very own first gaming design, uh, game design the project and it 
it took a new life. It was stopped short, the playtest. I just started the in-person playtest at the mm -hmm. beginning of the lockdown. And then I was introduced. For a while, I was like, yeah, I don't find a online tool I could run games with. And then I was introduced mm -hmm. to Miro, and which actually does the trick. And since then, I've been running a lot of playtests. And now, uh, I think... I'm not sure people are aware that much of that. Uh, it's Jason who made me Jason Pitt who made the, the recommendation I check into that but so many huge conventions are having online versions right now so I'm yeah. I'm gonna run playtest at Origins uh, if it goes well I might try to do it at Gen Con uh, here we normally we've got UK Games Expo which is somewhat as big sometimes a bit bigger than Origins it's having a, mm. uh, a virtual expo as well these are all events I could not have attended and definitely not within the comfort of my home run a number of playtests and engage hopefully with, with players there. So it's uh, it's a weird time for game design, but uh, an interesting one, I think. So Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm really glad. Uh, I think pretty much all the conventions, um, at least all the major ones that I know, have moved to online gaming or some variation of that. Um, I think online gaming, um, well, it's certainly a, a different experience than in person. Um, and like you, you definitely discover different things about a game uh, playing it online versus playing it in person. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, yeah, I, I I didn't actually know those three were actually moving online, so I'll have to check that out. That's that's really cool. That's good to know. Yeah, Origins. Uh, sadly, the I think the signups, but check on that because they extended it several times. The signups were closed on June first, but starting oh, okay. starting on the fifth, uh, the the games which are available would be visible to the wider audience so people will be able to to look what they're interested into and and then i guess a couple of days later people will be able to actually sign up for games but gen con they just announced it so it should still be possible to sign up for them and virtual expo as well so it's yeah for you hopefully it would be a, an interesting opportunity to engage with uh, a european audience I, I don't know if you ever attended at the opportunity to attend the uh, conventions uh, over here no, unfortunately, I haven't been able to travel that much. But I hear I hear really good things about the European scene. Um, I have a few friends through online gaming that uh, that tell me about it, and um, I would I would like to get out there sometime and uh, see what you all have going on. Sorry, someone is engaging in DIY, so I was muting myself and closing the, the window. <laughs> Fair enough, the weather is no bad. Worries. It's a week there. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, tell me, what, what is the game you are currently working on? Game or, or games? Uh, okay, what's, your, what's your pitch? Uh, can you make us salivate and tell us how and when to play sure. them? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, it's a little early for me, so... I apologize if my pitch is a little more rambling than usual, but um, essentially Brinkwood is, uh, to sum it up, it is Robin Hood versus Vampires. Um, you play as a group of uh, brigands, thieves, rebels, renegades, uh, living in this kind of fantasy punk, I call it castle punk uh, universe um, that is controlled by vampires. Um, and uh, basically your role in that world is you've been given uh, these gifts, these uh, masks uh, by the Fae, um, which allow you to use magic um, and allow you to essentially uh, power your revolution and power your rebellion against uh, the forces that try and keep you down and uh, keep you uh, oppressed. Uh, in this world, so um, so yeah, that's like the quick five minute pitch of it. It's a uh, it's forged in the dark. Um, so if you're familiar with games like Blades in the Dark um, or uh, um, why am I blanking on any other Blades in the Dark game? Uh, what, uh, Scum what? and Villainy. Yes. Um, there we go. Uh, 
games like that. Um, it plays very similarly mechanically um, and has kind of uh, what's unique to uh, both it system and uh, Forge in the Dark games is it has that um, uh, two sides of the game where uh, part of the game, you know, you're engaged in these missions and you're going out and you're fighting the vampires or you're sabotaging them or you're trying to recruit people for your rebellion or you're going out and doing things. And then the other half is more uh, structural uh, and it has this kind of downtime period where you're more focused on building up your rebellion, um, you know, taking care of things, uh, resting, gathering resources, that sort of thing. Um, and I really like how those two sides kind of feed into each other and can a lot of times create a really compelling campaign. Um, yeah. <laughs> so is the, because when you mentioned masks uh, ended out by the fair, I was wondering if it was sort of a, uh, also relying on the tropes of superheroes in a way that, or, you know, even something like Power Rangers where yeah. you have your regular identity and in your off time you are being Definitely. Bruce Wayne or your high school attending and then you put on the mask at night or during the day and suddenly you're, you're Sailor Moon or you're, you, 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 you're an <laughs> alter ego who's the one doing the, the fight. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone's um, made that connection uh, at, at least it's the first I'm hearing of it. Um, but that is definitely what it is, um, at least to a certain extent, where um, essentially what I've done is I've split the character sheet in half, where half of it is like kind of you, yourself as a mundane person, you know, kind of living your mundane life. Uh, and the other half is the mask, which you can kind of switch around and change depending on the circumstance, which essentially, like you say, you know, turns you into a super superhero or um, a magical girl or something like that, uh, where, you know, it gives you new powers and new abilities and kind of, um, I, I was most, I was thinking of it uh, when I was designing it in the context of like, um, a lot of the times in games like this, uh, players can get very protective of their player characters and like, worrying about like, oh, am I going to get caught? Am I going to be seen? You know, is this going to come back to bite me? Um, and uh, what the mask kind of allows me to do, both in fiction and mechanically, is kind of justify why, you know, no one's really sure who you are and things don't quite blow back on you in as quite a direct way. Um, which is nice because uh, Blades in the Dark tries to abstract most of those mechanisms into a uh, mechanic called heat, uh, which is more kind of like general and slow building and more, um, it, it's less uh, kind of up to GM whim, um, which I really appreciate. But uh, yeah, I definitely, I, I appreciate you making that connection because it's, it's definitely that thing of uh, taking on a transformative aspect and transitioning from being kind of a mundane character to a more uh, super powered or uh, amped up version of yourself. Well, I can wear a badge now saying uh, I was the first to make the connection and you can tell people around. It's, it's quite funny <laughs> the coincidence because I happen to have played my very first Blade in the Dark game this Monday uh, with uh, a group of people oh, cool. I hadn't played with before the, the quarantine and there was another opportunity. I thought it was, I had heard of the, the game for a while in a lot of podcasts so I was aware of a number of things but mm -hmm. playing it it was really fascinating how th there were several moments when a, a, a rule came up or a mechanic came up and I was like oh yeah the person who wrote that hated the same things in another game yeah. session as I did. Like, there was a yeah. rule, like, if you do the job, you get paid. The, no matter what, you're yeah. going to get paid. And I was like, oh my I God. That rule. I, I played so many games when you do the heist and then for some you're stressed out. Even if you get paid, you're stressed out about being paid or not. Here you get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, the flashback of the heist, I've been in so many heist games which you, you spend so much time planning. And right. I always thought, there's just two ways it goes. 
either it doesn't go according to plan, meaning you wasted three hours planning something which you know mm -hmm. is not applying anymore, or it goes according to the plan plan, and it's super boring <laughs> because it's right, just going, yeah. it's just following the script. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we did a mini heist and we did things which were quite bonkers, pretending to be florists. Uh, if people are aware of Blades in the Dark, I think uh, we played in French, so I think we, we invested the the headquarters of the Red Sashes pretending oh, yeah. to be two floral delivery pe person holding a, a gigantic <laughs> flower pot which allowed us to have nice. a, a level 5 equipment each by, because the pot was filled with our, with our, with our equipment and we entered there like oh, well, we, we're coming from the florist where are we supposed to leave that pot well, ok let us go inside and then go to the office and then someone running after us after we broke in the safe telling us you're not supposed to be here like well, we climbed it two stairs with that uh, can you help us at least give me the curry bring it down so on and and finishing leaving the the floor but right in front of the bride who's uh i guess the uh, the big boss of the sashes or someone important so who looked us straight in the face like you, you you the two guys the two of you are weird but i guess i got <laughs> other things to do at the moment but yeah it was mm -hmm. it was very very interesting in terms of it's not light but it's it's different and very interesting yeah, yeah, th those are, you, you hit on a lot of great points uh, why I love the system. Um, I think your point, especially around planning, like either you waste a bunch of planning or, you know, everything goes according to clan and, it, and, and, it's, and it's really boring. Um, I've, I've had games uh, in Blades in the Dark that kind of make both those situations interesting, um, where like, uh, people will say, okay, you know, we're, we're here to do this. And then, you know, they'll roll uh, all ones on their engagement role. Um, and it's like, okay, I guess we're here to do something completely different, you know. Uh, or um, I've had people play the game where they use flashbacks to effectively, like, almost plan as it goes. Um, will the, where they'll be like, okay, we're robbing a bank. Um, I want to flash back to uh, I like beat up the bank manager and like stole his ID and I'm pretending to be the bank manager now and like it it, it almost works like a really well oiled plan but because you're kind of coming up with it on the spot and you're building off of each other's ideas um, and it's kind of happening in the moment and you don't know whether or not it'll break it kind of preserves that tension and kind of gives you the same kind of feeling as like a really well planned out heist while still while not being as boring as actually executing a well planned heist would be uh in a role playing game normally so um i'm glad you had fun with it yeah uh, I re i'm not playing the second session until 2 weeks and uh, i'm really look looking forward to to play that game the the other thing you mentioned uh, i really need to Hone my uh, ability to that is uh, uh, be be happy, find joy in failure. I'm still someone yeah. stressed out from years of. Uh, I just left another campaign because uh, it it was too close to my very first role playing game. It was all about tension and it was too stressful, and I was not finding myself yeah. in it. But this, I realized, it made me. It, it was still worth playing this game, uh, which was, uh, again, something happening thanks to quarantine. People I haven't played with since 15 years or 16 years or so, uh, because oh, cool. I, I moved away from uh, where I was born. And uh, also life uh, took us apart. And yeah, with quarantine, they, they started playing online and they, they told, oh, we're going to invite people we haven't played with for a while. But then, then it made me realize what shaped me as a player and shaped right. also my game mastering and at the same time put it in contrast with stuff I, I don't quite... You know, there's a difference between learning about things you should do and how you could do things and, and mm. these things starting to be really in your flow, you know, in your veins uh, and you do it so... So I thought, like, oh yeah, I'm I'm being obsessed with the integrity of a logic, often of uh, the 
the fun of my players or, or the drive of a story uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah blades really helps with that but uh, yeah i need to learn to 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 be happy with failing forward yeah i mean it's it's a hard it's it's hard to row sometimes um i definitely understand uh where it can get difficult um i had an experience I'm trying to remember what her name was. Um, another designer um, who play tested it for me, who play tested Brinkwood, um, told me um, uh, summed it up really well, where she said, um, "I will swallow any of the knives you give me," uh, which was her way of saying, uh, like, if you give me the means to like. Uh, kind of make my character suffer or like make my character put my character in a bad position you know i'll take those because that's what i enjoy in the game um and what was really revelatory me revelatory to me about that was that it was more about less you know me kind of imposing consequences or imposing you know all these bad things happening to her character and more about her kind of having the choice as to what happened to her character and you know what her character was able to do in those situations and basically uh, getting herself and her character into that trouble, um, which I think is a really important uh, distinction that um, Blades doesn't always make 100% clear, but I think it's always better to give your players um, as much uh, choice as possible especially when it comes to kind of like negative outcomes and consequences. Um, I, I think one thing I struggle with a lot as a GM is um, giving consequences to my players. Uh, Cause I really, I, I really root for the player characters a lot. Um, I root for their success. So, you know, when the dice don't go their way or, you know, the game's mechanics call for some sort of consequence a lot of the times I'll soft pedal it more than I should and the players will have to be like, no, 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 like actually, actually hit us with something, you know, actually, actually give us a real consequence, you know, we want to see how bad this can go. Uh, <laughs> so um, I definitely, I definitely get the, um, the sense that, uh, you know, after however many years of gaming, uh, feeling it's it's like you know touching a hot stove and getting burned you know uh, if I, if I if I leave my hand here too long and I'm in this tense situation for too long you know eventually you're going to want to jerk out of it and I think that's um, it's always good to know your limits and it's always good to know um, why you're playing a game and uh, be ready to stop if you if you want to because the most important thing is we all have fun. Yeah, it's it's really a big question of uh, understanding, being clear with each other, the player and the game master, what what we are going for in terms of of teams and troops and so on. And on the other mm -hmm. end, a, a big question of trust uh, that you you're, you're confident that you you will be not make a fool of with your character, or you you won't kill the campaign by doing something. Right completely idiotic mm -hmm. and it, it also applies to to the players being respectful also of what the game master is trying to provide or curate for for all the players mm -hmm. uh, one game I, yeah. I played recently which i thought was quite good to hone that i really like to play it a second and third time it's uh, becoming a game of uh, heroism and uh, sacrifice it's it's a much smaller format than uh, than Blades in the Dark, it's by Brian Engard uh, at Dangerous Games, and you, it's so, it's almost the opposite of a GM-less game, uh, but at the end they, they meet in the opposite head, it's a three game master game, and one player. Oh nice. So you need to be four players, uh, one player plays the hero, and the three others have turn at playing three different fates, you know, the uh, the the three ladies who weave the fabric of destiny, each holding a a strand of people's destinies, and uh, and the, one of the the liberating thing of it is 
you the the hero is not gonna fail. Never. Right. It's the the idea is that the hero will always succeed in the story, but uh, it's described as a drama. Uh, what is it called? Um, engine, because w the role of the three game master, the three fate, is to make the situation as sad and dramatic as possible for the hero. So it's always difficult, impossible choices, things which are very bad which is going to happen uh, to the hero, but the hero will prevail still. And it's it's kind of liberating because as the player, you're like, okay, I can we can really pile on the bad things which are happening, but in the end, my hero will prevail. He will be broken or destroyed by the, the situation because that is the concept of the game. But he will still succeed somehow in the story. He will make, I don't know, if he's a leader of the resistance, he will be made prisoner. Everybody around him will, will be hurt or disappear. But in the end, that hero will overcome that dictatorship. But I don't know, maybe he will become the dictator himself or something like that. But it's up to the players and the game master. And you got different playsets. We played the playset on a spaceship, uh, the Exodus, which the, the concept is a spaceship looking for a new Earth for dying uh, humankind. Uh, there's a playset which is post-apocalyptical. And uh, I think the third one is like more medieval fantasy. But... But yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's liberating to focus the game on an aspect and remove uh, other aspect of most other games from the game, like success and saying success is there. No, don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, th that's really cool. Are there bits uh, which you would say your game maybe even more so than than other Forge in the Dark uh, games? Uh, what are the bits you focus on with your game and the bits which you you remove you put aside and said okay this is this is actually not not covered by the rules not not the focus of the game so we are overlooking those aspects mm -hmm. um that's a, that's a that's a really good question um <laughs> one that i kind of struggle with sometimes um uh, the thing about playtesting is um i forget which designer said this um uh, basically uh the process of play testing is like the process of losing focus or like trying to keep focus uh while doing something that'll make it lose focus um where uh the game has kind of been pulled in a lot of different directions um just by like different players and different sessions and like kind of just testing to see you know will it do this will it do that um like so we have everything from you know the players infiltrating like high society balls uh and having like these tense social standoffs to you know kind of your more standard uh like heist or assassination missions um i'd say and like one thing i've been surveying my players about is like you know where where do you think the game should focus and where do you think it should focus mechanically um i think from my perspective uh, the mechanics really drive you towards um, action, uh, as they do in all Blades in the Dark games, where um, all the mechanics are built around kind of going out and doing something or describing what you're doing in the frame of, like, being active. Like, I'm going to skirmish uh, this person off a roof. I'm going to, you know, wreck this door open. I'm going to... Uh, attuned to this magic it's all very active um, so that lends itself to uh, games and missions and sessions that are a lot more focused on particular objectives and kind of working to achieve them in kind of small limited scopes of time so again stuff like heists stuff like assassinations um, I've been trying to uh, broaden the game more kind of in the downtime section to kind of encompass things like, you know, revolutionary politics, uh, working with different factions, uh, kind of doing like organizational work, um, doing work, building relationships with other people, uh, build, doing work, actually like figuring out what the objectives should be, um, 
because a lot of the times um, I've noticed in my games, um, we kind of make objectives up on the spot um, and we kind of just, we say, okay, well, that's good enough. Um, we're not going to worry so much about, you know, how this is going to tie into everything else. But, you know, we want, we know we want to have this sort of game and we know that this sort of thing is generally happening over here. So this is what we're going to go with. Um, and what I'd like to see more of the game focus on is kind of um, that same flexibility, but in the service of like kind of larger objectives or uh, the sense that you're building to something with every move that you make. Um, I think one very valid form of valid piece of criticism I've received, and I don't think this is particular to my game. I think this is uh, something that you struggle with a lot in any uh, kind of like bigger game is that uh, it can feel sometimes like uh, there are really important sessions and then there's less important sessions. There's really like big things that happen and then there's small things that happen. And uh, the goal isn't necessarily to make it so that, you know, there is only big things happening or that, you know, nothing is ever, no time is ever wasted, but more, I think, uh, to try and get the feeling that you're building momentum um, and that uh, even when you're doing stuff that's more like prep work or things that seem smaller in scale that they're still kind of important to your larger objectives so it doesn't feel as um, I guess arbitrary um, so yeah, uh, I don't know. You you asked what my game does well, and I told you what it doesn't do well yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's a learning process. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, uh, my my own game is much tighter. It's very small in scope, but it's quite fascinating to to see the the feedback from people, and sometimes the feedback. Uh, are going in opposite direction, so you need to to right. remain in the middle and uh, and stay true to your vision, listening, but at the same time, keep in mind that what you're trying to do is one thing and not not another. So, what's what's the actual roadmap? Do you have any? What's do you have a, a deadline, a self-set deadline for? Yeah. What, what's the next um, stage? What are the the steps? If well, any. So yeah, uh, it's um. I'm sure you hear this a lot uh, in this day and age. Um, we were we were supposed to be on Kickstarter in April, so what like like two months ago. Um, but then uh, COVID nineteen happened, the quarantine happened, um, and a lot of people just didn't have money to spend on Kickstarter. Um, and a lot of Kickstarters around that time actually really struggled. So we took a step back uh, before launching, and we basically said, okay well, we should delay, um, we should make sure we're giving, you know, this enough time that people can kind of see how it plays out, people can play on their finances, and like, once things are a little more stable, you know, we'll try and put it back up on Kickstarter. Um, and I was really lucky that a lot of people were very understanding about that, um, especially, you know, I've been doing interviews like this one or uh, other stuff in the community, um, and, you know, I asked people to push back like release dates or like essentially to put caveats on their episodes where I said, we're, we're launching April 15th. Uh, that's not true, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so that was, that was unfortunate, but um, I think it was really necessary. Um, so right now we're kind of in this holding pattern um, where we're trying to figure out uh, when will be the best time to launch, um, whether or not, you know, uh, the financial situation for most people has calmed down to the point where, you know, it makes sense to launch in July and August. Um, don't think we're going to launch in June um, or even, you know, going into September or October. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, ha I have the habit of kind of like never being quite finished with anything unless I make myself be finished with something. Um, so I think it's good. It would be good if we could kind of get back on track and get back to a place where, uh, you know, uh, even if the game isn't perfect, uh, it's, you know, it's perfect for what it is. Um, 
So yeah, we. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know when I when I figure out uh, what my timeline is. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's yeah, it's tough when you create something. Uh, I've seen. I'm not even talking about game design, but projects in construction and architecture and in urban design, which are killed by optioneering, people trying to make it perfect while you, you need something which works well. You, you don't need something perfect because you're delaying and, 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 and killing the project by doing that. But uh, I guess it's more time yeah. for you to, uh, well, that's what you were saying actually, uh, to to show the game to people. Uh, I guess if people want right. to, to have a, a view of the game, the Brinkwood is the best place to find a, somewhere to join one. Yeah, Brinkwood.net. You can uh, download uh, a free copy of playtest rules, uh, such as they are. Um, and also, we have playtests through our Discord if people want to join. Um, I think there's also a couple other games. Um, I've been hearing uh, and seeing games on the Gauntlet, uh, the Gauntlet community. Um, I think uh, someone's been running a few games over there, uh, which has been really cool to watch. Um, so yeah, so there's definitely multiple ways to kind of get plugged into it and see what's going on. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am glad that I, I get the opportunity to kind of get it in front of more people and uh, show it to more people before we go to Kickstarter. But uh, yeah. yeah. That, that's something I'm really looking forward to with my own game. I think that time when I'm confident enough to hand the rules to other people and then hopefully see them seize them and start running the game on their side that that must be a, a very exciting moment huh? it is um especially uh because it i i've seen it run now like a couple of different ways uh far from beyond like how i usually run games um and it's been fun to see how the rules are don't really need to be adapted very much for different play styles and how people can kind of um, build out a game that's really unique to them and unique to their play group and to their style of a, as a GM um, and kind of like uh, make the game work for them. Because uh, I've always been a big believer that, you know, just because I designed the game doesn't know, doesn't mean I know like what the best version of the game looks like. Um, or what the like exact right way to play it is. Um, so it's really encouraging to me to see kind of variety in the play styles and how it's being uh, how it's being structured. Um, for instance, I think on the Gauntlet they focus a lot more on kind of the social relationships uh, and kind of the story building around it, um, and uh, that's been really cool to see. I think. Uh, the GM over there has been doing a really great job with it. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I definitely, I, I, I tell all my designer friends, you know, uh, get something that you can put out there uh, as soon as you can. Like, don't stress over it, obviously, but like the sooner you can get a game out to people and like start having other people like try and run it or try and play it, or even just read it, you know, the sooner you'll really get kind of good feedback. Um, I think one thing I struggle with a lot as a designer is like, I get very in my own head about how I make games and how I run games. So I kind of design for myself rather than designing for a wider audience. And as soon as you're able to start uh, getting feedback from a wider audience, you can really start to design for that audience and not just, you know, kind of be spinning your own wheels. It must be interesting because you, when you say you design for yourself, I imagine when you run a game, you design yourself, you as much create rules which support your style as you don't include rules which are, I guess, a given for you because you don't, you don't really yeah. need to enforce this style of play or this style of stories because you do it naturally, because it's you, and at this point you don't even realize it. So having somebody else run mm. it, you might realize, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, I, I haven't said anything about that, because for me it was, it was obvious, and it's not at all. Yeah, I think uh, one, of the big, one of the big things I learned was like, 
I don't know. Um, I kind of just balance stuff by instinct uh, rather than like having hard and fast rules for it. So like seeing people run games where if, like things go really poorly right out the gate because there wasn't a lot of like uh, guidance around how to balance certain things uh, has been really instructive. And I've kind of had to go back and be like, no, here's how you actually like balance, you know, a session and here's how you uh, essentially like, here's how you use these things. So you don't, you know, uh, put your characters in an impossible situation and things like that. Uh, because yeah, there, there are definitely things you realize with other people running your game that you just kind of uh, do by instinct that not everyone will do <laughs> exactly the same way you will, or even not exactly the same way you will, uh, will do uh, that needs to be done for the game to like work. Um, so uh, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely a big part of it. So something which uh, I find also interesting to enforce that in a in a soft way is, is the use of art. So uh, it's kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, I mentioned Sailor Moon when you said the the masks and the double identity, but hearing you talk about the game, uh, actually I'm I'm thinking well with, with what I know of the game, uh, I'd be tempted to to actually do that a magical girl thing or something like revolutionary girl Utina or Sailor Moon, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what's actually, but yeah, someone might have this idea hearing you or having something entirely the opposite, something very dark and, and grim, but uh, what's your your art like? What, what How did you come up with what would be the art which would be appropriate and what is the message you're trying to convey regarding the tone of the game you recommend uh, with mm -hmm. it? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, real quick, uh, I want to point out that uh, there's another really good Forge in the Dark game called Girl by Moonlight, yeah. which is essentially Sailor Moon, <laughs> the uh, role-playing game. Or like, I think it's like Sailor Moon, uh, magical girl anime in general. Um, and uh, I haven't actually had a chance to play it myself, but having read it and had friends that kind of highly recommend it, um, if, if you're after that experience, I would 100% uh, uh, recommend to yourself or any of your uh, viewers, listeners, check well, maybe, that out. Maybe I'll use yours because I want to tease you with that and uh, feel, <laughs> feel you, make you feel like, what what is Callum doing to my game? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm 100% okay with people doing whatever they want with my game. I've got people running it or talking about running it, you know, in like... Uh, kind of uh, 1930s interwar period and making it about like gangsters and cool. speakeasies and that sort of thing and I, I think I'm always thrilled when people take it in different directions I just I want to be clear that if you want to do magical girls there is a better game specifically <laughs> built for that no um, I just uh, I, I gotta give props to my other designers um but yeah, uh, back to my original point. Wait, what was my original point? So what's your art like and what is the, the oh, sort of right. tone you are encouraging with your game? Yeah, um, so my art is, uh, I've been really lucky. I've got a couple different artists. Um, I've got uh, uh, Steph MHC who does a lot of our monster designs. Um, uh, it, it was neat because I had I brought in some people to do like the narrative monster designs and like kind of create the narrative behind the monsters uh, and then had this uh, fantastic artist Steph uh, come in and actually start making drawings of them uh, and it's uh, it's a lot of it is very influenced by uh, video games like Bloodborne or Castlevania so it's kind of like this dark uh, Castlevania style um, uh, aesthetic to a lot of things um, and like that's kind of where we're going for it in terms of like the default setting um, in terms of tone um, I always uh, the joke I always make is that no matter what game 
you're trying to do or what tone you're trying to set for a game. Eventually, you know, if you have dice, it will become a black comedy or a dark comedy just by the nature of like things will go wrong when you don't expect them to and it will be funny. Um, and like if if you have any level of violence in your game, like that violence will at points be funny or that violence will at points be serious. Um, so uh, yeah, I kind of design with that in mind and I run games with that in mind. Um, I think the tone, um, and this is one thing I, I talk about in the game books is that I think the tone can really range from like taking uh, things very seriously and being like, okay, you know, we're telling, you know, despite all the supernatural trappings, we're essentially telling a story about people and their lives and about revolution. And it's important to be respectful of that. Um, and then on the completely other side, you can take it, excuse me, very gonzo, very over the top and, you know, make it a game about swashbuckling and about uh, kind of, uh, you know, the, the Robin Hood uh, archetype of, you know, haha, you know, I, I swing on the chandelier and, you know, I, uh, you know, rescue someone or, you know, I shoot the rope or I do this crazy trick shot. So I'd say, you know, if you've seen it in a, in a Robin Hood movie, um, it's just which Robin Hood movie you want to set the tone at, you know, whether or not you want to be uh, Errol Flynn or uh, if you want to be, you know, uh, the Disney Robin Hood with the foxes, or if you want to take one of the more like uh, serious reboots of it, like the BBC series, which I was a big fan of. Um, uh, yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> is it? Uh, you asked about art, and I kind of got off topic there with tone, but um, the art that we're going for is definitely um, a more serious, more. Uh, kind of dark aesthetic but um it's important to me that just because that's the way i envision it you know that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right way to do it or the best way to do it fair enough it's uh, uh your description also reminded me of a movie uh, i saw a while ago uh do you know the movie daybreaker um do i one second so I'm not sure if it was the writer or the director of Gattaca, but the concept is it's with Sam Neill. And the, the oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember this. Yeah, this is like a 2009 joint where it's like, yeah, most people are vampires. Okay, yeah, it's, Ethan Hawke was in it. So it's more it's modern day slash uh, dystopian futuristic, and uh, uh, vampires are the the most common. Uh, human beings uh, around most people in society are are vampires. Uh, they are uh, it's 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 a problem because actually there's not enough human blood for everyone, and you see people going to sort of right. Starbucks and they got a coffee with blood in it, and they go to their their work, and it's boring. And uh, yeah, the revolution mm -hmm. is about overcoming this corporate vampiric, literally vampiristic society uh, and so on but uh yeah it uh you, you, could, you could definitely uh take ideas from the movie or even set your game in there i think they, oh, they definitely thing in common in a yeah. more corporate sort of fashion yeah i think um daybreakers is definitely like the future if you don't win in my game um it's you know i i rem i'm remembering more of this movie and like it definitely took the same angle I did uh, where it basically makes vampirism kind of a metaphor for commercialism and capitalism. The idea that like, eventually you'll just run out of blood and then you'll be fucked. Um, I'm sorry, excuse my language. Um, in this, uh, in Brinkwood in the default setting, the idea is more that like, there aren't as many vampires as there are people um, just because um, it's more of a metaphor for like class and wealth and kind of the distribution of things. Um, and, but I, I definitely think, uh, yeah, Daybreakers is a good movie to watch. Um, I, I, if I remember right, it was 
like it wasn't a great movie but it was definitely like an interesting movie and a fun movie to watch yeah i saw it at the genre festival and uh yeah the audience was right for this the when the the movie would have uh dips in uh uh, energy and quality, the audience would make up for it with uh, funny comments. <laughs> but uh, yeah, nice. it was it wasn't mind blowing, and I don't think it was widely distributed in theaters. But uh, it was it was a neat little idea twist on on some classical other stuff. Like if you like if you like Dark Towers or The Matrix or Gattaca, uh, it's it's mm-hmm. in sort of of that vein while not being a up to to the best of them right right (laughs) yeah i mean there's there's certainly room for movies that are not of perfect quality but are of uh good heart i guess yeah and a good idea effort a good uh, original idea uh i'm afraid we uh, we are running out of time it's been a a true pleasure having you thank you so much for waking up uh early uh I don't I don't invite that many people from the Pacific <laughs> time zone because I know it's a, it's a struggle. It's already early on the East Coast, but then Pacific, it's a, it's a killer. Uh, yeah. What would well, be your... I, I yeah, was happy but, to be here. This is a lot of... Well, you're, you're welcome anytime uh, when uh, you you have more uh, a clearer view of, of what's going to be the, the way forward or not. Uh, you, you are more than welcome. We, we'll see if uh, I'm still running this because I'm running this as I am an employee. Then there's a lockdown, so I, I don't know where this is going. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's been a, a pleasure. Uh, what you do? You have anything else uh, left to to plug? Uh, where can people find you if you wish to be found? And uh, and yeah, the, what's your goodbye? Um, yeah, I guess. Uh... Just for the last time, I'll, I'll again plug the San Gennaro Co-op. Um, we've got a bundle together right now uh, to support various bail relief funds, so definitely check that out. Um, if you want to check out Brinkwood, you can find it at brinkwood.net. Um, and if you want to find me and just listen to me on Twitter, uh, or just uh, I love to connect with people um, you know, in the community, fellow designers, uh, people that like games, just you know talk about games i'm always up for it um just part of the reason i was excited to do this um so uh yeah you can find me on twitter at eric the barrack and i'm sure all of this will be linked so um so yeah this was this was a lot of fun thank you for having me um i i hope this keeps going because i had a lot of fun doing it and um yeah yeah, great, uh, and uh, hopefully, maybe one day you'll visit us in London uh, and we'll have coffee, and uh, I'll be able to interview you in person, uh, London or, or Birmingham. That would be, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, and feel free to, to send me anyone from uh, the San Gennaro Cooperative who have uh, mm-hmm. a king for waking up early, and I, I, I will be very happy to interview <laughs> them. Uh, thanks, uh, awesome. the people who joined us uh, on that stream. Uh, this Friday we should have Kevin Lovecraft from Misdirected Mark who will be joining us uh, with his uh, so I'm told wonderful beard uh, that's all I know about him because again I'm the least knowledgeable uh, podcaster in the hobby uh, thanks to everyone for joining and uh, yep yeah, see you Friday bye